video is brought to you by moviepalette.com. Hey everyone, do you have a favorite movie that you would love to hang on your wall, but you can't think of what scene or what poster to get? Well, now you can get the entire movie on one high quality canvas. With a moviepalette.com, you can get every scene from your favorite movie, or more specifically, the dominant color of every scene from your favorite movie in chronological order on a great high quality canvas. It also comes with a silver engraining uh, of the title down at the bottom. It has rubber stoppers on the back to keep it from bouncing. And they have a huge catalog uh, of what to choose from. Whether you're a horror fan or you're a fan of sci-fi, Marvel, uh, Japanese anime, Disney animation, drama, or Oscar classics, there's a movie palette for you. Uh, and right now, moviepalette.com is having a sale for 50% off for their Halloween sale. But if you go right now and if you enter room 15, if you enter room 15, you'll get 15% off of the movie palette of your choice. That's R O O M 1 5 for 15% off of your movie palette. Again, this is a great value for a great piece of home decor that that looks great for uh, for any film and for any film buff and anywhere in your home. You, you will definitely like this product. Mine is of The Shining, and I cannot be happy uh, happier with it. So, so definitely go to moviepalette.com and enter R O O M one five for fifty percent off of your palette. Hey everyone, welcome back to Room Two Three Seven. Back with another review, and I know it's not quite November yet. Uh, actually, by the time you're seeing this, it's Halloween Day. There is one more film that I want to review for Halloween, and then I'll get into the November reviews. But I figured I'd announce it now, and uh, I just wanted to start early. So I, I watched the first film for the November reviews, and my plan is to... This is something I've wanted to do for quite a while, just never got around to it, and it's... Movies based on real life serial killers. Now, that means with, with actors, not what's inspired by, you know, not like Psycho has a little bit of Ed Gein as does Chainsaw Massacre, Silence of the Lambs, not stuff like that. Ones where the actors playing the killer and telling the story. Now, most recently, I reviewed the new Netflix series Dahmer with uh of evan peters which was a a great great series and so that kind of made me want to go through the serial killer films that i have um, as i've said before true crime particularly serial killers has been the biggest passion or biggest interest that i've had in my life it's something i've been into for almost 20 years just reading and watching everything i can uh, it's a bigger passion than both horror and Batman, for me, anyway. So, I'm hoping I get all my information right. <laughs> but, uh, so I figured since the most recent one I did was the new Dahmer series, the first one here could be one of the first Dahmer films ever made, and that's the one from 2002, Dahmer. They simply put Dahmer. Which, originally, it had the title, um... Dahmer, the mind is a place of its own, but it just went with Dahmer, which I have as part of part of this killer three DVD pack, which comes with Gacy, also from two thousand two, and Ed Gein, which I think is from two thousand one. Now, and I just want to say ahead of time, I've already gone through and made a pretty comprehensive list of all the ones I don't have. So, if there's anyone that you can recommend or think of to tell me it's already on the list so or ask if I'm going to get to it it's already on the list I will get to it so don't worry about that and any compare anything to be said about the Evan Peters series I've already reviewed that so you can go comment on that video I want this one to be mostly just about the Jeremy Renner film because this one has Jeremy Renner as a Dahmer which I probably should have said yeah, I think a lot of people forget that Hawkeye from Marvel, uh, the lead from Hurt Locker, which actually was 
because of this film. He got the the role in Hurt Locker. I think my favorite performance of his is still uh, Carmine Polito in American Hustle. But he does do a good job as Dahmer. Now, before I get too far into it, uh, just some of the material I have on Dahmer. Uh, I do have several books, not all of them. I have Monster, the true story of the Jeffrey Dahmer murders, Inside the Mind of Jeffrey Dahmer, the Jeffrey Dahmer story by Don Davis. I have Lionel Dahmer's A Father Story and a Durf Back Durf's My Friend Dahmer. So I have done some reading on Dahmer. As far as uh, documentaries, there's stuff like The Jeffrey Dahmer Files, which is great. America's Serial Killers, which I have a few of these. I have another one called Beyond Evil. Other films like My Friend Dahmer, which I have reviewed as well. And I have probably between 20 and 25 just uh, encyclopedias, uh, if you will, of a bunch of serial killers. I just pulled this one because Dahmer's on the cover. He's on the cover of most of them. So I've done quite a bit of reading on Jeffrey Dahmer, who of course, you know, the Milwaukee Monster, Milwaukee Cannibal, uh... Killed 17 young men and boys, sentenced to 16. He, he was convicted of 16 of them because they never found the body of Stephen Hicks. And I believe it was because of Stephen Hicks. E either that or Stephen Tuomi, the, his second victim. Because of the lack of body of one of those, he was convicted of 16. Other sources say 15, convicted of 15 or 16. One will say 937 years. One will say 957 years that he was ultimately sentenced to. I guess it depends on the source. But ultimately killed 17. And this movie, this is kind of what you would call a bullet point film. Or at least that's what I call it. Where it has its pres present day structure. And then all these flashbacks to pretty much just essential bullet point periods of Dahmer's life. And this movie kind of stirred some controversy when it came out. Because people felt that the film, Jeremy Renner's portrayal, and David Jacobson, the director, his direction tries to paint Dahmer in a sympathetic light. Now, I don't care what anyone says. No, the Netflix series does with Evan Peters does not paint Dahmer in a sympathetic light. That shows him as is. That's why it's called, you know, Monster. But this tries to sympathize with him or almost try to rationalize his murders, which I can see why that's... If you want to paint a killer as someone that's just seriously disturbed or mentally ill, that's one thing. But to completely come out and try to rationalize the murders or justify them, which it does it in a kind of a subtle way. It doesn't come out and say, hey, he, he did this because it's not his fault as to why. It doesn't quite do that. But like a number of serial killer films, because... Actually, as far as movies go, the early 2000s, nowadays it's all documentary series and stuff. In the early, early to mid 2000s, there was a slew of films like this. Just ultra low budget movies where the title was usually the name of the killer. Most of them were directed by Uwe Lamel. That's actually a big chunk of my list is uh, Uwe Lamel films. Uh, fortunately, one that I can't get unless I buy it online because it's out of print is the first ever Dahmer film called Strange Life, which I think came out in 93, came out right at you know the height of Dahmer. And then there was another one called Raising Jeffrey Dahmer, which I think was more, more of a look at the parents, which I, I remember not liking that at all, but... 
I'd say the three best Dahmer films, having not seen Secret Life, even though I know that's more of like an exploitation slasher film, that's still fairly accurate. I would say this, My Friend Dahmer, and Netflix are all well done in their own way. Uh, Netflix really breaks everything down. My Friend Dahmer is the cautionary tale with all the warning signs. This is really just the a, a bullet point film. What I mean by that is, like the first few episodes of Dahmer, it's centered around the his last night of freedom. It doesn't say uh, July 21st, 1991, but it's the night he takes Tracy Edwards home, Tracy escapes, and he gets arrested. That's pretty much the present day narrative. And then we get all these flashbacks to just key moments, essentially. Which isn't a bad structure, but like a lot of movies from this period, names and events, the names have been changed and events have either been altered or sort of made into composite events, both for time and out of respect for the families. For example, the character of Tracy Edwards is renamed Rodney. And he's portrayed as more of a like a charismatic, effeminate, uh, supposedly closeted gay man. He, he's presented as closeted, I guess. Whereas Tracy Edwards on the stand, I believe, he said that he was not a homosexual. He just agreed to have Dahmer take photos of him. And I believe they met in a mall food court, not a sporting goods store like in the film. But it was it, directed by David Jacobson. He was inspired by uh, an interview by Lionel Dahmer on NPR and just a lot of the court TV stuff that was airing. Also Lionel's book he was inspired by. A lot of producers wanted to get behind him, but they were really grossed out and disturbed by the four-page treatment that he wrote. Which, the movie is not a graphic slasher film. Uh, if, if you're going into this thinking you're going to get some really disturbing, grisly visuals and him killing a lot of people, you're not going to get that. You get two on-screen deaths, really. It's more about just the psychological aspect. Like, what is making Dahmer do this, essentially? Really focusing on his alcoholism his loneliness. There are some moments of symbolism, like the last shot of the film. But, uh, it, it was made for $250,000 in 18 days. It does have this very low budget. It almost feels kind of like a Gus Van Zandt film, like this very low budget uh, 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 indie film. A lot, lots of still camera work. Only time it gets any kind of artsy or flashy is it does this kind of strobe effect with the camera when it shows him committing his assaults at the uh, bathhouse before he gets blacklisted. But written by David Jacobson and David Burke, stars Jeremy Renner as Jeffrey Dahmer, along with uh, Bruce Davison, who's been in a bunch of stuff. He plays Lionel. He does all right, but he's he's not Richard Jenkins, and he doesn't have that calm and gentle, yet always sort of at the end of his rope kind of personality that Lionel has. He's he's more domineering in this, I guess, to go into feeling to portray Dahmer as more of a misunderstood, lonely. This is why he's always in his own head. Why he's so lonely. Portrays him as more of a domineering father, which I don't think is entirely accurate. Artel Great plays Rodney. Matt Newton as Lance Bell, which they never say his name, but I think Lance Bell is the character of his first victim, whose real name is Stephen Hicks. Which, it doesn't say where he was going, it just saw him hitchhiking 
and it he picks him up. Uh, Kate Williamson as Grandma, and Dion Basco as Camte, who who was the character of uh, Connor X at the Symphone, who was the fourteen year old uh, uh, Blauschen boy, who he, he had you know his a drill put through his head into his brain had acid poured in because Dahmer wanted to create sex zombies. Dahmer left to go buy some more beer. Conorak was able to make it outside. His neighbors, who was Glenda Cleveland's niece and daughter, I believe, saw him, called the cops. Dahmer said it was his lover. Cops let him take him back inside, and then he was strangled. Here is portrayed as Dahmer doing that. He, he, he seems older than 14, which was probably their idea, you know, Let's not make him as young. But in real life, he was 14. Uh, but portrays him as, you know, Dahmer left to go to work. And that's when he managed to get out of the apartment. He still buys beer, but on his way home. So slightly altered. Also, it shows this character being his next to last victim. When in reality, there were four other victims in between Conorak and the night of Tracy Edwards with uh, roughly two months time uh, of in between. This is the next day. Also, and then also when it shows him picking up the uh, hitchhiker over and he's left alone, it makes it look like his mother is leaving for a weekend when in reality, she just up and left and took his brother and was gone for pretty much the whole summer. So, uh, like Monster, it's accurate as far as everything that happens. Everything that happens happened in real life. It's just slightly altered or slightly twisted. Uh, I would say more, though, more so than Netflix. I think Netflix is more you know, acutely accurate, but... Uh, I really do like Jeremy Renner's performance. Uh, also, <clears throat> and as far as key moments of his life, you know, okay, so we have Conrack being brought back to his apartment, then being killed. Him, the the thing with the mannequin, where his grandma found the mannequin and he got in trouble, he had to take it back. The thing with the lockbox that had the severed head in it. And Lionel was forcing him to open it. And he had to come up with a story. And then trick him by saying there was pornography in there. Only this makes it the same event. When in reality it was two separate events. <clears throat> Again that was probably done more so for time. And it seems seamless. Like you know Lionel sees the mannequin in the closet. Happens to notice the box. So they make it work. But in reality it was two separate events. Him... Uh, getting into the, the bar and bathhouse nightlife. How he started drugging men, date raping them, how he got blacklisted, he got caught drugging them. And that's about it. I mean, we see one other body in his bedroom, which is an unnamed, unseen. He's just already there. His apartment looks like Dahmer's apartment you know it does make it does draw attention to the fish tank but nothing about the fridge doesn't have the blue acid vat again it, it focuses more on his you know, a mental state rather than you know uh, chronicling all his murders and then where it makes him sympathetic is after he kills Stephen Hicks or Lance Bell in this and he disposes his body which it does show him getting pulled over cops asking what's in the bags and him saying lawn trimmings which the cop in this the cop buys it and lets him go where in real life I believe they got another call over the radio and just let him go but after he disposes the body and cleans up it shows Dahmer sitting on the couch 
holding the guy's denim jacket and just sobbing uncontrollably. You know, feeling remorse, feeling sad, feeling like he couldn't control himself. And so it does try to paint him in a sympathetic light. And, you know, there's shots of him at work. It shows him working at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory. Like, during lunch, there's all these people at lunch tables. He's by himself. Uh, you know, it does show him when he's younger, walking through the woods, hitting trees with, with a bat. It shows the stick with the dog skull on it. The very last shot of the film is Lionel dropping him off for therapy. And then when he drives off, he leaves, and he, we just watch him walk down into the woods alone. As if to visually say that, you know, he's walking his own path of loneliness. He's, you know, walking away from help. He's just going to go, go about it his own way. And, and then it ends with a text saying that he, you know, after two years of his sentence, he was killed on November 28th, 1994, in prison. As if to say, that's where walking that path got him, along with everything else we saw. And it does end with Tracy Edwards, Rodney, which, and the whole thing with them, like, they, in real life, it, it was a very risky escape. You know, tra Tracy was able to overpower Dahmer and get out of the apartment. Whereas here, oh, and also Dahmer was just being weird and Tracy kind of had to, you know, try to make him feel okay until the right moment to escape. Whereas here it portrays them as acquaintances, becoming closer, and, you know, spending the whole night together, which isn't quite what, I, I, I get what they're doing. They're trying to show Dahmer's socially awkward side, how socially inept he is and his inability to relate to people, which Renner does do a good job at. But, you know, he, he puts the cuffs on Edwards and at one point he even agrees to take the cuffs off. He flees. He leaves without being stopped at one point. Then he comes back saying there's no bus. And Dahmer goes to, you know, strangle him with a belt, but then he stops and he just lets Rodney leave. Almost as if to say, I've had enough. Like, it wasn't an escape. It was more of, I can't keep doing this. You can go and I'm okay with whatever happens. That's the way the film portrays it anyway. And also, you know, he throws a rock or something through the window. We see daylight, like he was there all night. When in reality, he was only there for a very short uh, period of time. It was still nighttime. Now, Jeremy Renner, uh, his accent is a, a Midwest accent. He, he does have one. You can tell he did, you know, do, do his homework on Dahmer. <clears throat> His accent isn't as good as Peter's. Uh, I'll still say Peter's is probably the best portrayal of Dahmer. However, when we see Jeff, when he first starts going to the, the gay bars, he has a flashback seeing himself going into the bar for the first time. That, that is when I think an actor has looked the most like Dahmer. Right. He has the comb over, he has the glasses, shirt tucked in, he's all like perfectly you know, stiff and awkward. So I think that was probably the best looking, like closest to the real Dahmer that we've had to film. When, when it shows him when he was younger, specifically the early 80s, gay bar, bathhouse era. I would still say Peter's is the best, but... Renner does do a good job, and he does do a good job at that disconnect also, like just being unable to connect to people or really talk to people normally, really get this sense of loneliness. So Renner does do a good job. And I, 
I think he does do a good job because he's portraying it the way the movie wants it to. Now, if they were going for a more dark, unsymp unsympathetic portrayal, I mean, Renner's a great actor. He really is. So maybe he could have pulled it off. But where it's going for this more sympathetic, type, more kind of a rationalization type of route, you know, Renner is this sympathetic, uh, you know, which might be a, <laughs> might leave some viewers conflicted, but he, that's the angle they're going for. He does do it well. I'm not saying it's right, but if that's what they're going for, and you know he, he, he did do it well. So overall, I would say this. Uh, I do remember seeing this for the first time when I was in high school. I think this was actually one of, if not the first, real serial killer movie that uh, I had ever seen. I had already done a bunch of reading on Dahmer, but um, uh, I wasn't like fully versed on a lot of key events. But I was expecting more of like a slasher film, seeing how he committed all these murders. So I remember being disappointed and not liking it when I first saw it. But the more I see it, the more I like it. And it it is a pretty accurate portrayal of what happened. Now, as far as the violence goes, there is some blood when he kills Lance, uh, Stephen Hicks, you know, blood covered kitchen uh when he it also ends with him cutting the conorak character open and then sticking his arm in and feeling around i always thought it looked weird because there's no blood it looks like his torso is hollow maybe it's because he's been dead for so long that there's just no blood i just thought that was a weird effect but that's the last time we see present day Dahmer. Then we have the flashback with the therapy and him leaving. So whatever either inconsistencies or inaccuracies there are, it's just the way some of the events were told or the names of some characters um, or all characters, but Jeff and Lionel. It, it's not like a fully fictitious movie, like say Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer which is widely, uh, uh, heavily fictionalized, which is the point of that movie, because we don't really know what Henry Lee Lucas's life was like. But uh, I, I would also call this kind of a beginner serial killer movie, because it is one of those uh, a bullet point films where you, know, you have the final event, you know, his last to-be victim, with all these flashbacks of just all the key moments of his life that pretty much any book, movie, or documentary is going to talk about. So uh, I would call this kind of a beginner film. It, it's also not really disturbing on like a, a graphic level, um, maybe a psychological level, but yeah, it, it definitely has just the the most embarrassed of essential of events and facts from his life. It's, and again, it's not super inaccurate. It's just the same way you're going to get with all these movies. Like, oh, instead of, you know, events either being put together as one event or names being changed or whatever. But uh, I do like the way it's filmed. I like the indie, low-budget, look it does have this kind of voyeuristic feel to it you know, with all the still shots the the music is very interesting like the the piece that plays as he's walking into the woods at the end in the end credits kind of sounds like nirvana's something in the way which really fits the tone of the film so yeah th this is a movie that i do like and i can recommend it just know you might want to reference a book or a documentary just to get more of the facts straight. So it's, it's not like it's fictional, but, and again, for the last time, as far as everything that happens, 
happened in real life. It might just be the way they unfolded. So again, uh, so yeah, this is going to be the marathon for November. Uh, real life serial killer movies. And again, no real need to recommend any or ask if I'm going to get to any. Because I have a full list of pretty much everyone that's been made. Both TV and theatrical or direct-to-video. Uh, I already have a good amount. So I'll be getting to those. I'll be getting more as the month goes on. And I'll also be showing what material I have on that specific killer when I do a film. And then at the end of the month, that's when I'll do like the collection video of movies, a full collection of books, which I'm about to break 80 serial killer books. So I actually just had to buy a new bookshelf uh, this afternoon. And uh, I hope all my information has been accurate. Uh, I'm not trying to debunk these movies, but you know, it's like I said in the beginning. Uh, this has been the biggest passion of mine for most of my life. Like almost 20 years. True crime, serial killers, mass murders, stuff like that. It's a bigger passion, interest, or topic of interest than both horror and Batman for me. So this is something I'm really passionate about. So hopefully I got all my stuff right. And I'm really going to be into this marathon. Uh, and uh, I hope it's something you're all into as well. But anyway, stay tuned for many more serial killer films to come. And thank you for watching.